Hello there. Okay, so um, I'm going to give a review about the Batman uh, film, um, but I'm gonna I want to sort of go into a bit of a deep dive about this really because it's important that we back, sort of I back this up with content of an, an understanding of why I feel like I do. Okay, so when I was a kid. Um, I collected comics. I think I've mentioned this to you a few times before. Um, it started with Wizard and Chips and the Beano and all those sorts of things. And then it went on to, um, I actually managed to get hold of a huge amount of comics at a, at a church bring and buy sale in Humminbee in the village I lived in Yorkshire. Uh, I went down there with my mum and dad and I found this big pile of comics someone was throwing out and they were called Amazing Tales and Strange Stories and, and, weird, and Science, I forget another one called Weird Science or something. Um, but ma mainly what they really were, were 19 reproductions of 1950s comics um, that were, um, they were kind of subversive really in lots of ways. Their content were was always either horror, science fiction or, um, you know, fantasy related um, narratives, which were really just a way of framing stories about paranoia and um you know anti-war messages that kind of thing and i fell in love with these comics and i had loads of them and i started very quickly after that to collect dc comics and i kept collected a lot of superman uh and then I, I started collecting also um the marvel comics as well at the time uh whenever they came out didn't come out very often and didn't really get a lot of them in the uk i i seem to remember they were sort of they were they weren't regular you know they were um at my local um, post office, they used to come in every now and again, and I just used to go and collect them whenever they were there. But I fell in love with the Hulk, and I fell in love with, you know, a lot of those characters through, through you know, the X-Men, etc., as they started to emerge as well. So through my teenage, I, I, you know, and a lot of this is, relates back to my, my dyslexia and my difficulty in reading. I think I've mentioned this before. So um, anything with pictures was great for me when I was a, a young teenager. So like I said, Tin Tin, tin Asterix, and also all of these comics. So as I got older and um, started obviously playing with Little Angels and we were doing a lot of touring, um, I was constantly looking, I, I, I taught, essentially taught myself to read um, as a very late developer. It wasn't until I was sort of 14, 15 that I even picked up books properly. Um, and it wasn't really until we were touring with Little Angels that I started to read novels um, and it was very difficult. I found it very, very tough. So in between times, I kept advancing my my reading abilities by picking out by buying graphic novels because they were the perfect um I guess they were the perfect pivotal point where storytelling through pictures and words beautifully written uh you know hard bitten storytelling came they 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 coalesced and I first one I really bought was this which is the killing joke which is a um a pivotal moment in comic um, comic writing and drawing uh, by Alan Moore, Brian Boland and John Higgins, of course. And this changed my opinion about the Batman. I had, I guess, passed him by. I'd not really gotten into um, Batman in the way that Bob Kane, and I forget the other guy's name, Finger, I think his second name was, the originators of the, of, of the character and the iconic, and all those iconic characters, the Riddler, the Joker, etc., the early works didn't really appeal to me, I've got to say. And um, I mean, I loved the TV series, you know, uh, the Adam West and Burt Ward, you know, kitschy sort of like over the top primary coloured version of um, of Batman. And of course, that's how it looked when it first came out, you know. Um, and, and who didn't love that TV series? The da -na 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 Batman. It was very iconic for the period. Wasn't it? So we all used to rush and watch it. But aside, aside from that, it wasn't really a, a character that I'd kind of fully involved myself in. But when that came along, it changed everything, and I started buying these uh, the, the the Batman stories in whenever they whenever they arrived. Um, now, this actual story came out in 1988, which was one year before the Tim Burton Batman film was released. Uh, and it didn't prompt me, actually. I just picked this up. I picked. I remember I, picked, I brought this in Scarborough um, at W.H. Smith's because it happened to be on the shelf. And I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. I love the sleeve and all the rest of it. In fact, actually, as a little aside, we contacted, Little Angels contacted Brian Bolan, who created that brilliant cover. We contacted him um, about doing... A little angel's record sleeve, and he wanted to do it, but it was an absolute fortune, so he didn't end up doing it. Anyway, so I digress. So anyway, um, so the let's talk about the films a little bit as they came along. Um, so 
Tim Burton. So Tim Burton re released the Batman film, simply titled, entitled Batman, of course, in 1989 to an unsuspecting world uh, and changed the dynamic of not just comic book filmmaking. It was one of the very first comic book filmmaking on a grand scale, of course, but also in terms of the way that uh, people appreciated, I think, graphic novels and graphic art. And there was an explosion after that point of stories and books. Um, it really did help to really introduce graphic novel writing and, and drawing to a much wider global audience. Um, and But the film, let's talk about the films. We're here to talk about the films, really. I like that movie. I went to see it in Scarborough to a packed house in the old Futurist, uh, sorry, in the old um, Odeon, which is now the Th Stephen Joseph Theatre and Around. Absolutely packed it was, you know, it was, it had a standing ovation at the end. It was a pivotal moment. It reminded very much of when Star Wars um, was released because I had a similar experience in the same cinema. Uh, but it was a, it was a huge global phenomenon, wasn't it? You know, Michael Keaton, you know, the car, um, you know, Jack Nicholson playing the Joker. So much of it was right. And so much of it was great. But I have to say, it doesn't for me bear a lot of repeat viewing. Um, since it was released. Why? Because it doesn't match up to my personal um, interpretation in my head of what the Batman represents. It's very much a kind of slightly, I, I guess, more serious take on the primary colour approach that the um, that the, uh, the Adam West version of the TV series was. Of, co of course, it was more serious than that. But all that sort of, you know, the primary colours, the neon, you know, that, that sort of thing, the big costumes, you know, um, and the over-the-topness. I mean, that was Tim Burton all over, of course. But it was an incredible success and an enormously successful movie at the box office. And, um, you know, it, it, lots of it was, so, was, was very, very good. You know, uh, I did really like Michael Keaton. I think he was a fantastic Batman, actually. Strangely, I think sort of one of the absolute best, you know, certainly knocks the spots off of Ben Affleck, in my opinion, uh, for instance. But um, but not, you know, it, it, for me, it was kind of it had a frivolity to it that was not what I hoped. So I watched the rest of the movies with a kind of wry eye, really, I think. I mean, I think the best of the series for me after that was the second Tim Burton film, Batman Returns, which, you know, um, you know, with Danny DeVito playing the Penguin. I, I loved that. I thought there was something... That was that wistful Tim Burton approach. It was even more so on that film in lots of ways, but it had some deeper layers. You know, there's some really great moments in that. I love the opening salvo with the with the uh, um, the parents of, of of the penguin throwing him into the river and the the, the, the baby sort of caboose moving you know, going down the river and all that. It's fantastic. Some great scenes in it. It's a really really finely written film actually. But after then. For me, it just went downhill and downhill and downhill. I mean, to end up with Joel, Schu um, Joel Shoemaker making Batman and Robin uh, with everything that we know about that, Arnold Schwarzenegger, etc. Um, just, just dreadful, you know. And, and I, I sort of remember I watched them all, but just with a sinking heart, you know. Who's ever going to get this character? Really, this is just a Hollywood, you know, massive Hollywood film, you know that. that they don't care about as much. They don't really understand the mythology, you know. So it was with some enormous thanks and a sense of relief, really, as a, as a, as a lifelong Batman fan, when Chris Nolan, of course, brought out his incredible trilogy starting, I think it was in 2003, I think it was, the first one came out. And um, changed, again, changed the landscape. He fully understood what the character character was, who that character um, should be, how it should be represented, and, and, and firmly established the idea of Batman in the real world. That real world approach, you know, um, who is he? Okay, so he's a billionaire, you know, he makes these incredible gadgets and he uses his wealth to fight crime. But it was deeper than that, wasn't it? It was, it was the disturbed, broken characterization, you know, of the backstory and we got all that sort of thing. And um, and I think Batman Begins was a fine film. The scale of it, you know, the understanding, the palette, the colour palette, the the want to dis rediscover and reinvent the idea of that that character. And it was clear that the filmmakers had read those stories. So that was really, really important. Now, controversially, I I don't really think there was a lot of soul in that first film. I think it only really came into it. I think it was fine and I, I really enjoyed it. It's not a film I, 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 I watch on repeat, actually. I mean, you know... Whereas the second movie, of course, um, um, The Dark Knight, with, especially because of Heath Ledger, of course, 
was an extraordinary film. And I think he's widely regarded as a masterpiece. And I would completely and utterly agree with that. It is a staggering piece of filmmaking and took everything that Batman Begins did and, cha you know, and, and amped it up um, and honed in on all the right points, you know, made, or made it about these um, maniacal, broken characters. And a lot of the reason why I love Batman um, is because actually he walks the same line as these, these, these broken characters. It's the real world. You know, it's like they often sort of say police corruption is as close to some of the, you know, some of the, um, the criminals that they're trying to catch. Absolutely it is, because it's driven by the same thing. It's just a different side of the line, you know. So, I, and I've always loved that. That's what kept me coming back, actually. Is he, you know, will Batman stray? Will he, will he eventually end up killing that person when he's, he, he, you know, his whole thing is he doesn't, you know, of course, you know. Um, so it was, th that, that's what I liked about that, you know. Um, the scene where, you know, Christian Bale has got um, the Joker by the, by, the, by the cable and he's pushed him off the building and he was going to kill him, but he doesn't kill him. You know, all those sort of things. He treads that fantastic line. Really brilliant characterization by, um, by Ledger specifically, I think. Uh, and again, the filmmaking staggering. Wasn't so enamoured with the third one. I've got to say, Dark Knight Rises, I know that Chris Nolan was reluctant to make a third one. And I think it tells, actually, you know, um, it's a it's a tour de force of filmmaking, don't get me wrong. And it grossed a bit over a billion dollars. I think it actually made more money than than, than, than the Dark Knight, you know. Um, but just because it made a lot of money doesn't make it, you know, doesn't make it the greatest film ever. You know, of course it doesn't. Um but you can understand why there's a depth and a clarity and a continuation and a, and a and a clearly a love. I think you know you can clearly tell that the filmmakers loved making those movies, um, and you know and, and everyone involved had a, a, a clearly had a, invested themselves in the characterization. So brilliant, brilliant trilogy, probably one of the greatest trilogies of all time in many many ways, and cha again changed the environment. So what came after that? Well, you know, we have we've had the DC new reinvention with Ben Affleck, which I think is a disaster. I've got to be honest. Um, I don't like the DC films. I think they've really misstepped in lots of ways. I think Zack Snyder, I mean, I'm a fan of Zack Snyder. I think, you know, um, Dawn of the Dead and um, and I think also even even <laughs> a lot of people think I'm mad about this, but I think even his, his version of Watchmen is fantastic, you know, um, very close to the book. I mean, I, I know that um, Alan Moore absolutely hates it, but I think actually as a film, it's 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 really good, you know, um, and I really enjoy I really enjoyed it. So, but anyway, so he's a good filmmaker, Zack Snyder. But I just don't think I don't like his Superman. I don't like. I just, there's something about it. It just doesn't. It doesn't. It's too it's crazy. Crazily, it's too reliant on the CGI. It's too reliant on um, the, the the bombastic nature of it. it. Doesn't get into the heart of the character. That's what I want. I want characterization. I want to discover who these people are. You know, um, and find out the, the 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 real intensities and why not not just rely heavily rely upon on on um, camera trickery and and you know and sort of like um, VFX to, to pull it off. You know, uh, I find those films hard to watch because there's just too much to watch. You know that sort of thing. Uh, so so you know, I was I've never been enamoured with Ben Affleck, and I was absolutely horrified when I read in you know in the trades that Ben Affleck was going to be. Um, going to do a standalone Batman film and he was going to be in it and oh, I thought oh no this is going to be terrible and I I just thought here we go again it's going down the tr going down that trail of, of destroying the the kind of the whole idea of what it, what it represents so when they announced that they were making a new The Batman it was going to be called The Batman I was initially thinking about why why would you do this why would you who's ever going to get beyond Chris Nolan and Christian Bale's um, you know, interpretation of this story because that's about as close as he's ever got, you know. Um, but then I read that that Robert Pattinson was going to star in it and I was immediately intrigued. I thought, ah, this is some smart casting. Why? Well, contrary to a lot of haters out there, I think Robert Pattinson is a fine actor. I've watched him over the, over the years develop in films like Good Times, an independent film about um, a guy gets out of prison uh, and he's got, a, I think, an autistic brother. And there's a fantastically deep character study there. Great in the Lighthouse, weird film, but a brilliant, brilliant performance. You know, very brave, incredibly brave. And Cosmopolis, another great film that he stars in. And and, and also, I've got to say, the Twilight films. My kids love those films, and I used to sort of wander in while still watching them and watch parts of it. And I do think he designed himself in those films. You know, that kind of brooding, dark intensity that says very little, but you know, but emotes. You know, the kind of gaunt. Um, wasted character of that you know of, of of that vampire of course you know so there is 
there was a lot to be had. I think it was all there on the screen. And I know that he has said in, in, in interviews that he feels cornered by the Twilight films because he'd made them as a young man. But I would say that really, I guess it's the same as Daniel Radcliffe, you know, um, with, with Harry Potter. You know, when you're young, you know, that, and you establish yourself in that way, it's a great bench a great benchmark and it's also a great way of springboarding to other things if you choose the right films and you can and you can evolve and I think he is doing that so well so I was intrigued by his his casting um and it immediately I thought hang on that's smart and then I found out that Matt Reeves was the director now I'm a huge Matt Reeves fan I think his um his take on uh fantastical narratives and the way that he, he he tells those stories. I mean, he did it brilliantly well with his first major studio film, Cloverfield, of course, and then he went on to executive produce the other Cloverfield films. Extraordinary film, groundbreaking film in many, many ways. Um, and then, of course, the Bat uh, sorry, the um, the uh, Planet of the Apes trilogy that he that he directed. Each one better than the last one. Um, wonderful films, actually, you know, and and he made a brilliant, he directed a brilliant version of, of Let the Right One In, which is called Let Me In, which was a remake of the, I think it's a Norwegian film, I think, uh, about, uh, you know, take on the vampire uh, epic, of course, um, or take on the vampire icon, uh, iconography. So, um, yeah, so I was extraordinarily tempted um, by this, and, um, and, and, you know, the combination of Matt Reeves and you know, Robert Pattinson was like, it was juicy for me, you know, so, and of course, you know, we've had the pandemic, and they started shooting it in 2019, I think, and there was a lot of naysayers, I mean, immediately the internet erupted, oh, he's the wrong guy, how can he possibly do it, you know, what, what, what are they, what are they thinking of, you know, Robert Pattinson, the, the Twilight guy, you know, and I just thought this is really, really unfair, and not at all founded in reality, um, he's an actor, and if you know his other work, you'll know what a fine actor he is and how he invests himself in the character. So I was really excited. So I went along with my daughter, Maddie, um, who is a TikTok influencer. She's got a career doing that and she's doing brilliantly well at it. And she gets invited to a lot of uh, major events. Um, and, I, and she rang me up all excited and said, Dad, you, you, I've got been invited to uh, a Q&A with the actors and, the, um, actors and the, the creatives of the new Batman film. Do you want to come along? And I was like, do I want to come along? It's like, of course I do. This would be amazing. Now, I would always just be standing at the back. She was going to ask a question to Robert Pattinson. Now, sadly, it got cancelled at the last minute. It was a real shame. Um, but the whole event went on anyway. So the whole idea were, was that we were going to go and do this Q&A and then go and watch the film after. Um, and there was only 30 of us. You know, I was I was a plus one. I wasn't even important. But there was all these other TikTokers and all these other people as part of that world, plus a load of people from Warner Brothers. But they left the exhibition up um, and we went and we went down into what was the um, it's, it's the old tram tunnels outside of Holborn station. And so there's a whole there's a great big long um, tunnel that goes into under the ground and it's blanked off because it would have been gone into what was, I guess would have been the original underground of some description. But it's still there. And they filmed one of the parts of one of the scenes for the Batman there. And so that was the reason why it, it was put into that, that space. But we saw the car, the car, which I think is amazing. It's a brutal um you know, sort of functional vehicle. It has no, uh, you know, it hasn't tried to be, they haven't tried to be flash with it, which is brilliant. It echoes the characterization of, of Batman as well, I think, you know, really fantastic sort of um, approach to it, I felt, I feel. So the car was there and the costumes for Zoe Kravitz's character of Catwoman and Batman were there on display so we could see them and, and touch them amazingly. So that was that was good enough, you know. I mean, I, I think I put a couple of films up for you guys to watch anyway that you can see what that was all about. And that was brilliant, you know. Um, but then we went in to watch the film and we watched it in the executive lounge at the Warner Brothers house in London, which is literally just down the road from Holborn as well. So we want to, we were very, very, felt incredibly privileged to be in this space watching this film. So what is it like? Okay, my friends, put aside all of your prejudices that you might have about Rob, Robert Pattinson and also put aside what you think you know about Batman. This is the Batman film. It is an extraordinary achievement on every single level. It is the Batman film I have always wanted. Robert Pattinson owns the character. He is the broken soul, the haunted the haunted, uh, twisted mind of mania that's descended into psychoses on the edge of madness. You know, it's like watching, you know, in the same way that the Joker film, you know, the Joker film was on the, it's like you're watching someone who is mentally deranged, mental, has mental illness and has found a psych, it's, it's, it's psychotic. It's the same thing. 
um, but it's shot through with a sense of total reality. This is not the Batman that you know from Nolan. This is not the billionaire who uses all of his wealth and power and influence to to change everything. He's not buying anybody off. He's not creating, doesn't have these labs and, you know, and, and he, you know, everything's grubby. You know, the, the bat cave's grubby and, 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 and disheveled, you know, um, he, he's obviously using some of his wealth to, to create a situation where he can become the vengeful, uh, you know, avenging angel that he wants to be. But in reality, it's all very homegrown. It's filthy under the fingernails. He's doing a lot of it himself. There's lots of shots about avenging parts and, and the suggestion that he's built the car himself and all this sort of thing, you know. And it's so much better because of it. And he's a conflicted character. The whole thing is is so, so well rendered. And there's a vulnerability to him, which has never been shown before, which is always in the, for me, a lot of it's part of what the, the great stories, the really great graphic novels about Batman were all about. The vulnerability of the character and how he finds his way. You know, he starts off in this film by, um, you know, talking about uh, and revealing the fact that um, he's utterly obsessed with finding out the reasons why his parents were killed and here is the genius of this film it is not a backstory there is no reboot there is no going back to yet again seeing the origins of his parents being killed outside of the theatre that is ignored in favour of examining what wealth and privilege and position does to people um, how men and women are so violently horrible and evil to each other and how that can all um, how that's all framed uh, and, and how he reacts to that, being this kind of character that is broken by the death of his parents and obsessed to the point of mania to find out why and to, to avenge them. But then that's how the story evolves. I'm not going to give away all the details because you need to go and watch it. But then the story starts to evolve from there. This is a detective story. I mean, a lot of people forget that the, st the main premise of Batman from the very early years was the fact that he was a detective. The, the world's greatest detective, you know. Um, it's not just about the kind of the gadgets and all the rest of it and the car. It's actually about his intellect and his ability to see into the criminal mind because he's experienced it as a child. You know, he saw it firsthand. Um, and he walks that line, like I say, between, uh, you know, the possibility of him being one of them, you know. Whilst he's beating up one of these characters, you know, really... Is he as bad as them because of it type of things? That's I love that, you know, that sort of examination, that storytelling and that kind of like, you know, that questioning, you know. So what you see is this incredible, almost noir-esque Raymond Chandler, maybe James Elroy style story of uh, revealing this detective story um, through. Um, I've got to say one of the things I didn't like about the film, and it's only a mighty nitpick because I'll come on to my criticism later on was there's a lot of exposition, what we call exposition, which is kind of like telling you the story as it goes. Now, I found a lot of that, there's a lot of that in this film. You have to really listen. You have to listen to what's going on. And there's a lot of explanation, um, which is actually, as a screenwriter myself, that's one of the things they say, show, don't tell. But they are telling everything in this. And uh, some of it gets a little wearing, I've got to say. But it's it's OK. You know, you have you sort of learn to accept it. And it's part of their telling of the, to the story. That's the way they've chosen to do it. But it's got voiceover, like a lot of those early noir films. You know, it's that sort of thing, you know. A bit like, sort of, it reminded me very much of um, of Blade Runner. Uh, you know, and everyone, you know, I know that, that a lot of people hate the, the voiceover. But I actually really like the voiceover on the original uh, version of the film. Because it's, again, it leaned into that noir-esque sort of, uh, sort of filmmaking from, from the sort of 30s onwards, you know. So, um... It's a detective story. We, it reveals through very clever storytelling the layers of the story. Another thing I love about this film, <clears throat> especially to do with Catwoman and Zoe Kravitz, who is a standout performance, wonderful char characterization. She is as sassy as she is sexy as she is broken and violent. You know, the combined all of these are wonderful sort of characterizations, uh, character characteristics into this, into her performance, and she's fantastically delivered it. Um, but part of the reason why it works so well is that she is a woman of colour, of course, you know, as is Jeffrey Wright, you know, who plays who plays Commissioner Gordon, who's another um, man of black origin, of course, you know. Um, and what I love about this storytelling and the way that the script writers have, <coughs> have, have rendered this story is that they do not shy away from the now. They have captured the Z-Geist. They are talking very smartly without virtue signalling. And there's no 
not even a hint of PC in this, don't get me wrong. It's more about the reality. It examines race, it examines sexuality, it examines the problems of the internet and the ballooning problems that we're now seeing. It examines the, the, the state of wealth and how that um, is obviously playing out on a global scale now and the inadequacies of those people, as well as the so terrible decisions powerful people are making just because they're wealthy. It's all that stuff and it's the underlying nature of how we as a, as a global community um uh, sort of absorb that and, and 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 spit it out the other end and how we somehow uh, you know and I've always found this extraordinary but this is this film examines this how we somehow lord it, it we lord it you know we we celebrate this you know we think that people of power are somehow are better than us when really it's it's actually a lot of them have bought and sold things you know it's not about winning the hearts and minds of people it's about buying buying and selling the hearts and minds of people so very clever script writing it's very smart right in the now it could easily be now it could easily be new york it could be washington it could be moscow you know given the current uh, state of things it's a it's set in a metropolis that could, uh, could resembles any of those 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 um those places so what you get is this fantastic deep examination of all of these things some fantastic performances as well the 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 supporting cast next to to robert and uh, and to zoe kravitz is extraordinary like i said jeffrey wright wonderful that that guy is such a treasure such a treasure in hollywood that calm gentle confidence that he brings he's building up a huge repertoire of those characters you know right through bond um <clears throat> and, and, and all lots of other performances that he's made fantastic fantastic character actor um, but one of the standouts for me is Co Colin Farrell, who you do not recognise. He plays the Penguin and I couldn't tell it was him. It is unbelievable. And it's so much better because of it. You're not examining his character because it's, you know, you recognise him. You're examining the character because of the performance. Extraordinary. Wonderful. It's And the prosthetics that they've chosen are so clever because it slightly suggests the kind of Penguin nose through the fact he's had some kind of disfigurement through his underworld you know, involvement, but it's not over the top. It's, he's, he's an underworld boss, you know, he's got that sort of, that horrible nature to him. So fantastic standout performance and very funny in places. And I've got to say, there are two or three scenes in this film, specifically one that involves the Penguin, that are quite simply some of the best stuff I've ever seen on screen for this type of film. There is a car chase in the rain that will take your breath away. I didn't think there could be a car chase done any better than something like Bullet, say, for instance, or maybe, you know, the um, the freeway chase on the second um, um, Matrix movie. But, you know, and there are, lot, there are lots of others. But this is extraordinary. It reinvents the car chase. Uh, it's in the rain, like I say. It's with trucks. It, it involves the Batmobile, of course. But it's just the way they've shot it. It is fantastic. I literally was completely fucking breathless when it stopped. There's another beautiful, beautiful film piece of filmmaking in the in the film where in a corridor you, it, it reveals a fight between Batman and some bad guys, but only using the lights emitted from the muzzle flashes of the guns. It is balletic. It is poetic. It is absolutely wonderful. So there's so much to enjoy here. Now, so what are my criticisms? Right, OK, but some slight miscastings. I didn't think I didn't think Andy Serkis pulls off. Um, the character of Alfred in the way that I'd hoped. Um, he's OK. He, he gets away with it. But for me, that's one thing about the Nolan movies with Michael Caine. He inhabited that role. It's exactly how I imagine Alfred to be. Circus plays it a little bit more kind of East End. It's a little bit more kind of um, grittier. I think it kind of works in places, but I didn't really believe it. I've got to be honest. Um, but he's not in it a lot, and so he kind of get, he somehow gets away with it. There's also um, a problem with Paul Dano, for me, who plays the Riddler. It's not all bad. He's a fine, fine, fine actor. But he just steps the wrong side of the line with the sort of shouty characteristics uh, a little bit. And um, I found him equally as irritating as I did engaging. Now, maybe that was the point. Maybe that's OK. Um, and maybe that's me sort of making a bit too much of a fuss. But that's the only thing I would say. I'm not certain he was... Um, exactly right. Although a lot of the scenes that involve him is in, obviously he's got his costume on and it isn't revealed that it's him until late and late into the film. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, of course. Uh, and the story surrounding him is, is brilliant, you know. So 
I think really it's more to do with his personal performance. I think um, I would have, for me, it needed to be dialed back slightly, but but maybe that that's their choice. So it's a, it's a minor criticism. It doesn't ruin anything. Both him and Circus uh, are don't don't take away from the ensemble, which is brilliant. And I've got to say, you know, they are fine actors. So you kind of it's there's not like it's a major major misstep. Uh, Peter Sarsgaard, fantastic in it um, as um, a police a corrupt policeman. Loads of great little bit parts in there. Fantastic. There's two guys play twins, twin doorman, uh, which are which is a kind of there's a kind of joke about that as the film evolves, uh, evolving Batman, which is really really funny and great, really well done. Fantastic. You know, I mean, I've got to like I say, I've got to praise heap praise on Matt Reeves as a film director. He clearly has read these stories. He knows what this what what I think what the the a fan like me, a fanboy like me wants from Batman. And his production team and everyone around uh, the production design, the the you know um, the 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 DOP, um, the, the the editors, they've all clearly got it, and it's they've rendered this universe of Batman that is simply the best I've seen. And um, you know they shot all over the world. They shot in the Necropolis in Glasgow. They shot quite a lot of it in Glasgow. Shot a lot of it in London. Shot a lot of it in Chicago. They've used the kind of the the scene, scenic staging to their advantage and um, never over the top. There's a, there isn't a lot of CGI in this, I don't think. If there is, it's very hidden, a lot of practical effects um, and all the better for it. You know, um, it's it's a kind of, again, it really reminds me of the way that they did the Joker. I think they've obviously looked at the Joker and seen how successful that was and gone, well, we're going to do the Batman version of that and we're going to bring this in and we're going to try and make those universes you know, meat sort of thing. So, um, and I really sincerely hope they make more of these films. To see um, Joaquin Phoenix, um, not Joaquin Phoenix, yeah, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix, of course, yeah. <laughs> to see Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker in his characterization that he did um, uh, with, uh, you know, on, on the Joker movie would be wonderful to, in, in this with this kind of filmmaking style. So I really hope that happens. But yes, the the the, the production design, the colour palette um, is is the earthy tones, the reds, the, the browns, loads of shadow, a lot of rain, you know, very noir-esque, you know. Um, but it never over it's never overbearing and fantastically measured, I think, you know. Um, so anything else that's a criticism? I would say that uh, the, the main things for me is it's a bit too long. I think some of the scenes drag on a bit and they could have easily cut back some of the scenes. One of those scenes that really went on a bit too much was one with um, Andy Serkis when he's in the hospital. And I think they could have cut it in half and it would have been a better scene, you know, um, personally. Uh, the ending goes on and on and on a bit and I, I felt that was that was a bit of a misstep um and I think the last act of the film does strain to convention a little bit and I was a little disappointed with that but it's so beautifully shot and there, there is stuff in in it that <laughs> looks so great that it, it kicks the arse out of most films trying to do something similar anyway so there's a kind of I forgave it for that too. Um, and I guess there's a kind of need and a desire and a responsibility to make sure that by the time you get to the end of it, there's this bitch, there is a bit of crash bang wallop. Um, so it's minor stuff. It's minor quibbles. The main thing for me is this film is being made by people that love the character, understand the, the atmosphere and, and, and have delivered in spades <clears throat> the, the reality of what Batman, how I always hoped him, him to be, um, especially over the, in, in recent years through the, the recent books uh, how that can be genuinely represented and I think they're, they've made such a fine show of this that I can only applaud them um, go see it, that's all I can say um, you might think it's rubbish I, I, I think as, a, as a, c a cinema fan myself and as a fan of movies and a fan of comic books this is about as good as it gets uh, and I sincerely, sincerely hope Robert Patterson and Zoe Kravitz get all the accolades they deserve um, and it goes on to to gross a load of money so they can make more of these films because they are truly truly great um, but above all more than anything else the central performance of Robert Patterson matched with Matt Reeves obvious, obvious love of the storytelling um, is what has made this film what it is and they you can tell they're enjoying every moment of making this but it is at its heart a detective story, but it's a detective story that go that is very, very long. So take your sandwiches, bed in and enjoy. For me, this is a 10 out of 10. 
my quibbles are minor and I really, really hope you enjoy it. It's out this Friday, I believe. Um, so yeah, I think uh, March the 4th, isn't it? So yeah, hope you like it. I hope you've enjoyed this review. I hope you've enjoyed me wittering on like a sort of like frothing fanboy, but I can't help it. I'm, I thought it was wonderful. So yeah, hope you like it. Take care. Thanks a lot.